Good evening, families. Teacher Danya here for week 12 of our Narnia Clubhouse unit. Tonight, we'll read chapter 16 of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. As always, I'll begin with a brief summary of the chapters we've read already so that we're all caught up on what's happened so far. Our book tells the story of four children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, who discover another world called Narnia while hiding in the back of an antique wardrobe. Lucy is the first to discover Narnia. She has tea with Tumnus the Fawn, who tells her all about the evil white witch whose enchantment makes it always winter in Narnia and who has the power to turn people into stone with her magic wand. When Lucy returns home to tell the others about her adventures, they don't believe her, but Edmund eventually finds his way into Narnia as well. He meets a mysterious queen who feeds him magic food and promises to make him king one day if he promises to return with his brother and two sisters. When all four children finally enter Narnia together, they discover that Mr. Tumnus has been arrested and imprisoned in the White Witch's castle. They befriend a pair of beavers who tell of the arrival of the great lion, Aslan, who is the true king of Narnia. It is Aslan who will save Narnia from the White Witch's evil rule and reign. During a delicious dinner at the beavers' house, they make plans to meet Aslan at the stone table, but Edmund sneaks away to the White Witch's castle. When he arrives, he encounters an enormous courtyard filled with stone creatures, but he decides to betray his brother and sisters to the White Witch anyway, telling her all about their plans to meet Aslan at the stone table. Edmund quickly realizes she really is evil, but it's too late. He's taken as her prisoner while the other three children arrive at the stone table and meet Aslan for the first time. During their journey, the eternal winter of Narnia melts into a glorious spring, signaling the weakening of the witch's power. Upon their arrival at the stone table, the children inform Aslan of Edmund's betrayal, and Aslan makes a promise that all will be done to rescue him. Aslan then takes Peter to survey the entire country and tells him about the four thrones of Ker Paravel, which will one day be occupied by Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy as queens and kings of Narnia. Meanwhile, just as the evil queen is about to kill Edmund, a rescue party arrives and delivers him safely to the stone table where he is reunited with his brother and sisters. The White Witch arrives shortly thereafter and demands to kill Edmund as punishment for his treachery. 
she reminds Aslan that it is her right to do so according to the deep magic. Aslan somehow convinces the witch to renounce her claim on Edmund's life. Everyone leaves the stone table to prepare for battle, but Aslan journeys back in the middle of the night. Susan and Lucy discover he's leaving and journey with him back to the stone table where the white witch and her minions have gathered. It is there that they discover Aslan's plan to sacrifice his own life in place of their brother Edmund's. They hide in the darkness and watch as the white witch kills Aslan on the stone table. But the next morning, they discover that Aslan's body is gone and there's an enormous crack down the middle of the stone table. Aslan has resurrected from the dead. A deeper magic that the witch knew nothing about was activated by Aslan's sacrifice. Lucy and Susan climb onto his back and he takes them on the ride of their lives to the White Witch's Castle. And that's where we'll pick up the story. Chapter 16, What Happened About the Statues? What an extraordinary place, cried Lucy. All those stone animals and people too. It's, it's like a museum. Hush, said Susan. Aslan's doing something. Indeed he was. He had bounded up to the stone lion and breathed on him. Then, without waiting a moment, he whisked round, almost as if he was a cat chasing his tail, and breathed also on the stone dwarf, which, as you remember, was standing a few feet from the lion with his back to it. Then he pounced on a tall stone dryad which stood beyond the dwarf. It turned rapidly aside to deal with a stone rabbit on his right and rushed on to two centaurs. But at that moment, Lucy said, oh, oh, Susan, look, look at the lion. Now, I expect you've seen someone put a lighted match to a bit of newspaper, which is propped up in a grate against an unlit fire. And for a second, nothing seems to have happened. And then you notice a tiny streak of flame creeping along the edge of the newspaper. It was like that now, for a second after Aslan had breathed upon him, the stone lion looked just the same. Then a tiny streak of gold began to run along his white marble back. Then it spread, then it colored, and it seemed to lick all over him as the flame licks all over the paper. Then, while his hindquarters were still obviously stone, the lion shook his mane and all the heavy stone folds rippled into living hair. Then he opened his great red mouth, warm and living, and gave a prodigious yawn. And now his hind legs had come to life. He lifted one of them and scratched himself. Then, having caught sight of Aslan, he went bounding after him and frisked around him, whimpering with delight and jumping up to lick his face. Of course, the children's eyes turned to follow the lion, but the sight they saw was so wonderful that they soon forgot about him. Everywhere, statues were coming to life. The courtyard no longer looked like a museum, it looked like a zoo. Creatures were running after Aslan and dancing around him till he was almost hidden in a crowd. Instead of all that deadly white, the courtyard was now a blaze of color. Glossy chestnut sides of centaurs, indigo horns of unicorns, dazzling plumage of birds, ready brown of foxes, dogs, and satires, yellow, stockings and crimson hoods of dwarfs, and the birch girls in silver and the beach girls in fresh transparent green and the larch girls in a green so bright that it was almost yellow. 
And instead of deadly silence, the whole place rang with sound of happy roarings, brayings, yelpings, barkings, squealings, cooings, neighings, stampings, shouts, hurrahs, songs, and laughter. Oh, said Susan in a different tone. Look, I mean, I wonder, is it safe? Lucy looked and saw that Aslan had just breathed on the feet of a stone giant. It's all right, shouted Aslan joyously. Once the feet are put right, all the rest of him will follow. Uh, that wasn't exactly what I meant, whispered Susan to Lucy, but it was too late to do anything about it now. Even if Aslan had listened to her, the change was already creeping up the giant's legs. Now he was moving his feet. A moment later, he lifted his club off his shoulder, rubbed his eyes, and said, Oh, bless me, I must have been asleep. Now, where's that dratted little witch that was running around on the ground? Somewhere just by my feet it was. But when everyone shouted up to him to explain what had really happened, and when the giant had put his hand to his ear and got them to repeat it all over again, so that at last he understood, then he bowed till his head was no further off the top of a haystack and touched his cap repeatedly to Aslan, beaming all over his honest, ugly face. Giants of any sort are now so rare in England, and so few giants are good-tempered that ten to one you have never seen a giant when his face is beaming. It's a sight well worth looking at. Now for inside of this house, said Aslan. Look alive, everyone. Upstairs and downstairs in my lady's chamber. Leave no corner unsearched. You never know where some poor prisoner may be concealed. And into the interior they all rushed, and for several minutes the whole of that dark, horrible, fusty old castle echoed with the opening of windows and with everyone's voices crying out at once, Don't forget the dungeons! Give us a hand with this door! Here's another little winding stair! Oh, I say, here's a poor kangaroo! Call Aslan! Phew, how it smells in here. Look out for trap doors up here. There's a whole lot more on the landing. But the best part of all was when Lucy came rushing out, shouting, Aslan, Aslan, I found Mr. Tumnus. Oh, do come quick. A moment later, Lucy and the little fawn were holding each other by both hands and dancing round and round for joy. The little chap was none the worse for having been a statue and was, of course, very interested in all that she had to tell him. But at last, the ransacking of the witch's fortress was ended. The whole castle stood empty, with every door and window open, and the light and the sweet spring air flooding into all the dark and evil places which needed them so badly. The whole crowd of liberated statues surged back into the courtyard, and it was them that someone, Tumnus, I think, said, But how are we going to get out? for Aslan had got in by a jump and the gates were still locked fast. Oh, that'll be all right, said Aslan, and then rising on his hind legs, he bawled up at the giant. Hi, you up there, he roared. What's your name? Oh, giant Rumblebuffin, if it please your honor, said the giant, once more touching his cap. Well then, giant Rumblebuffin, said Aslan, just let us out of this, will you? Oh, certainly, Your Honor, it will be a pleasure, said Giant Rumblebuffin. Stand well away from the gate, you little uns. Then he strode to the gate himself, and bang, 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 went his huge club. The gates creaked at the first blow, cracked at the second, and shivered at the third. Then he tackled the towers on each side of them, and after a few minutes of crashing and thudding, both towers and a good bit of wall on each side went thundering down in a mass of hopeless rubble. And when the dust cleared, it was odd, standing in that dry, grim stone courtyard to see through the gap all the grass and waving trees and sparkling streams and forest, and the blue hills beyond that, and beyond them, the sky. 
Oh, blow if I ain't all on muck of sweat, said the giant, puffing like the largest railway engine. Comes of being out of condition. I suppose neither of you young ladies has such a thing as a pocket handkerchief about you? Oh, yes, I have, said Lucy, standing on tiptoe and holding her handkerchief as far as she could reach. Thank you, Missy, said Giant Rumblebuffin, stooping down. Next mo moment, Lucy got rather a fright, for she found herself caught up in mid-air between the giant's finger and thumb. But just as she was getting near his face, he suddenly started and then put her gently back on the ground, muttering, Oh, bless me, I've picked up the little girl instead. I beg your pardon, Missy, I thought it was the handkerchief. <laughs> no, no, said Lucy, laughing, <laughs> it is. This time he managed to get it, but it was only about the same size to him as a small ibuprofen tablet would be to you, so that when she saw him, he solemnly rubbed it to and fro across his great red face, and she said, Oh, I'm afraid it's not much use to you, Mr. Rumblebuffin. Uh, not at all, not at all, said the giant politely. Ever meant a nicer handkerchief, so fine, so handy. So uh, I don't know how to describe it. Oh, what a nice giant he is, said Lucy to Mr. Tumnus. Oh, yes, replied the fawn. All the boffins are. One of the most respected of all the giant families in Narnia. Not very clever, perhaps. I never knew a giant who was, but an old family. With traditions, you know. If he'd been the other sort, she'd never have tempted to stone. At this point, Aslan clapped his paws together and called for silence. Our day's work is not yet over, he said, and if the witch is to be finally defeated before bedtime, we must find the battle at once. And join in our hope, sir, added the largest of the centaurs. Of course, said Aslan, and now those who can't keep up, that is, children, dwarfs, and small animals, must ride on the backs of those who can. That is, lions, centaurs, unicorns, horses, giants, and eagles. Those who are good with their noses must come in front with us lions to smell out where the battle is. Look lively and sort yourselves. And with a great deal of bustle and cheering, they did. The most pleasing of the lot was that the other lion, who kept running around everywhere, pretended to be very busy, but really in order to say to everyone who would hear him, uh, Did you hear what he said? Us lions! That means him and me. Us lions! That's what I like about Aslan. No side, no standoffishness. Us lions! That meant him and me. At least he went on saying this till Aslan had loaded him up with three dwarves, one dryad, two rabbits, and a hedgehog. That steadied him a bit. When all were ready, it was a big sheepdog who actually helped Aslan most in getting them sorted into their proper order. They set out through the gap in the castle wall. At first, the lions and dogs went nosing about in all directions. But then suddenly, one great hound picked up the scent and gave a bay. There was no time lost after that. Soon, all the dogs and lions and wolves and other hunting out animals were going at full speed with their noses to the ground, and all the others streaked out for about half a mile behind them. They were following as fast as they could. The noise was like an English fox hunt, only better because every now and then, with the music of the hounds was mixed the roar of the other lion and sometimes the far deeper and more awful roar of Aslan himself. Faster and faster they went as the scent became easier and easier to follow. And then, just as they came to the last curve in a narrow, winding valley, Lucy heard above all these noises another noise, a different one, which gave her a strange feeling inside. It was a noise of shouts and shrieks and the clashing of metal against metal. Then they came out of the narrow valley and at once she saw the reason. There stood Peter and Edmund and all the rest of Aslan's army fighting desperately against the crowd of horrible creatures whom she had seen last night. Only now in the daylight they looked even stranger and more evil than before. There also seemed to be far more of them, 
Peter's army, which had their backs to them, looked terribly few, and there were statues dotted all over the battlefield. So apparently the witch had been using her wand, but she did not seem to be using it now. She was fighting with her stone knife. It was Peter she was fighting, both of them going at it so hard that Lucy could hardly make out what was happening. She, she could only see the stone knife and Peter's sword flashing so quickly that they looked like three knives and three swords. That pair were in the center. On each side, the line stretched out. Horrible things were happening wherever she looked. Off my back, children, shouted Aslan, and they both tumbled off. Then, with a roar that shook all of Narnia, from western lampposts to the shores of the eastern sea, the great beast flung himself onto the witch. Lucy saw her face lifted toward him for one second with an expression of terror and amazement. Then lion and witch rolled over together, but with the witch underneath. And at the same moment, all warlike creatures whom Aslan had led from the witch's house rushed madly onto the enemy lines, dwarves with their battle axes, dogs with teeth, the giant with his club, and his feet also crushed dozens of foe, unicorns with their horns, centaurs with swords and hoofs, and Peter's tired army cheered, and the newcomers roared, and the enemy squealed and gibbered and, and ran to the wood as it re-echoed with the din of that onset. And that is where we will leave our story tonight. It's been eight weeks since we learned of Mr. Tumnus's arrest and imprisonment in the White Witch's Castle. Today, Mr. Tumnus was finally saved along with all kinds of other captive creatures. Just as Aslan resurrected from the dead on the stone table, hundreds of stone statues were brought back to life by the power of Aslan breathing upon them. I can't help but remember how concerned Lucy was when she found out that Mr. Tumnus had been arrested as punishment for letting her return home. Her great hope was that somehow Mr. Tumnus would be rescued. How overjoyed she was as he and so many others were brought back to life. The entire castle and courtyard was completely transformed from a frozen graveyard of cold gray stone to a colorful expanse of living, moving, breathing, joy-filled creatures. They were dead, but now they are alive because of the power of Aslan. And those who are freed from the witch's magic are called upon by Aslan to go and find all the other statues from around the castle. Leave no corner unsearched, he says. Well, the power of God to bring new life to us is just the same. And when we believe and accept Jesus into our hearts, God calls us to share this good news with those around us so they can have new life too. In week two, we studied part of a very old letter from the Apostle Paul who instructed the believers in the city of Corinth to choose their friends carefully. In that same letter, Paul calls us ambassadors of the good news we have in Jesus. These words can be found in the Bible. We believe that the Bible is God's word written to us so we can believe in him. It tells the story of the world, how God created us, how humankind has chosen to do wrong things called sin, how sin has separated us from God and what God has done to bring us back into a right relationship with him because he loves us so much. It also tells all about who God is and how God wants us to live so that we can be more like his son, Jesus. Today, our reading comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. 
The old life has gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The big idea of this passage is that God wants us to pass on the good news about Jesus Christ to people around us who do not yet know about him. Now, have any of you ever heard of a family heirloom? An heirloom is a treasure that is either valuable or important to a family. That treasure gets passed down from one generation to the next. I brought in a very beautiful and old ring made of Black Hills gold that has been in my husband's family for generations. It has been passed down from firstborn son to firstborn son, and someday my husband will give it to our son. Now, I don't have any family heirlooms, but I do have something that I've passed on quite a bit. My mom's chocolate chip cookie recipe. I have baked this recipe hundreds of times since I was a little girl. How many of you enjoy chocolate chip cookies? I know I do. Well, guess what? Many of my friends have enjoyed my mom's recipe so much that they asked me to pass it on to them. Some of my friends even told their friends about the recipe and they asked me for it. And even now, our kids are all growing up and baking the same recipe. We're passing it on from generation to generation. We love to share the things that are important to us. We pass on yummy recipes or funny jokes that make us laugh. We, we recommend movies and books, all sorts of stuff. This is what Paul is talking about when he calls us ambassadors. Only, instead of passing along a cookie recipe, Paul is urging us to share the best news that ever was, the good news about Jesus. When we come to faith in Jesus, God gives us more than just the gift of new life. He gives us a message about what God has done through his son Jesus to share with others. The Holy Spirit plants in our hearts a desire to see all people come back to God. Paul calls this being ambassadors of reconciliation. We have a message from God for all people about how they can be made right with God who loves them. Now, how many of you have ever had a fight with a friend? I know I have. Doesn't it feel so good when you're able to make up and be friends again? There's nothing better than helping people make up with God. Nothing better than helping them be reconciled to him so that they can receive his amazing love. We can do this when we tell others about what Jesus has done for us. Well, in our story, Aslan breathes new life into all the different statues in the White Witch's Courtyard. The creatures who are freed from their eternal prison of stone are in turn commissioned by Aslan to search every corner of the White Witch's Castle for other statues who need Aslan's life-giving breath. In obedience, Lucy goes and is finally able to help free her good friend, Mr. Tumnus. Just as those statues receive new life, so can we. And just like they were commissioned to help others be healed, you and I are called to share the message of reconciliation to the world. Like Paul says, we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. As we close this evening, I have some questions for you to discuss as a family at the end of our time together. Discussion question number one. Can you think of a time when you passed something on to someone you loved? 
It might be a favorite t-shirt that you outgrew and gave to a younger sibling, or maybe you shared a funny joke that you heard. Take a moment and share something important from your day or from this past week with your family. Discussion question number two, what do you feel when you think about sharing the love of Jesus with other people? Talk as a family about what it means to witness to the existence of God's love and grace in our lives. There is a wide variety of ways that we respond to this call to being God's ambassadors to the world. Discussion question number three. Can you think of someone, maybe a friend or a family member or a neighbor that needs to hear about the message of reconciliation? Most of us know people that don't know Jesus. One of the best next steps we can take is to simply pray for those people diligently and consistently. Take a moment to pray for the names that are shared. Now you and I are going to pray. Would you please bow your heads and close your eyes with me and go ahead and repeat after me. Dear God, I praise your holy name. You are good and faithful and wonderful. Thank you for inviting me into your plan of redemption. Thank you for forgiveness and new life. Holy Spirit, please help me to share your message with others so they can have new life in you too. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this week's memory verse is Matthew 28, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. If you would like to print out a memory poster, head to inewhope.org. Okay, we've got a couple birthday shout-outs this week. The first is Michael Long, who turned nine yesterday, April 21st. Naya Owen turns eight years old tomorrow, April 23rd. Happy birthday, Michael and Naya. And I want to give a special belated birthday shout out to Eli Boddington, who turned six years old last April 8th. Hope you had an awesome birthday, Eli. Well, thanks for joining us this week. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for our last week of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Good night, everyone.